Good morning, Alex. Once again, what a privilege it is to bring God's Word to you. Yes, we are still virtual right now, but we're not too far away from gathering physically in our Father's house once again. And I'm super, super excited for that. I'm looking forward to fellowshipping with you physically, talking with you physically, and even preaching in person. It's been such a long time since I've done that. You know, I love the recording team. They are faithful. They are dedicated. They are amazing people who sacrifice their time to record our messages. But church, nothing beats preaching to you in person. And I'm so looking forward to that, church. I hope you are too. Hope you are too. Amen. Church, today God has laid something in my heart. He's laid in me a message that I'm eager to share with all of you. So without wasting any time, let's just pray right now. Father, your children have come, Father. Ready, expectant, and hungry for your word. And I pray, Father, that you will use me as your mouthpiece to deliver your word with clarity and boldness. I pray, Father, that as they are listening, wherever they are, that you give them attentive minds and an open heart. Let your will be done in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, turn with me to Matthew 7, verse 15 to 20. I'll give you three seconds to get there. If you're reading a physical Bible, you better get some practice. We're going to be back in church soon. And as you open your Bible, if you see all the fonts in red, don't be afraid. It's not a misprint. It simply indicates that Jesus uttered these words. Really interesting. Let's take a look at what he said. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? Or figs from thistles. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And pay close attention to this last verse. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. The title of my message today is The Evidence. The Evidence. Just Jesus is saying that the evidence of a good tree is its fruit. For he says, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, or a bad tree can't produce good fruit. And by the fruit, you will know the health of the tree. And he's saying this in the context of false prophets, or false teachers, or preachers if you like. I want you to know this. Nobody wakes up in the morning wanting to deceive people, wanting to lead them or people astray. In fact, if you had an honest conversation with a false prophet, you will find out that he has good intentions. He really wants to help people and is genuine about it. But why? He presents God as a liar 
is because he did not believe in the testimony that God has borne regarding his son. And I know when I say that, automatically your head goes to 1 John chapter 5. We've been quoting that passage of scripture throughout this month and even throughout the years in this church. And you're spot on. Let's head over there. And God has revealed to me a revelation from this passage of Scripture as I was studying it. Let's read. And I'm reading from the Amplified Classic Version. This is He who came by with water and blood, His baptism and His death, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Not by in water only, but by in the water and the blood. And it is the Holy Spirit who bears witness. Key point. Because the Holy Spirit is the truth. So there are three witnesses in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three witnesses on the earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree. They are in unison. Their testimony coincides. If we accept as we do the testimony of men, if we are willing to take human authority, the testimony of God is greater, of stronger authority. For this is the testimony of God, even the witness which He has borne regarding His Son. He who believes in the Son of God, who adheres to, trusts in, relies on Him, has the testimony, possesses this divine attestation within Himself. He who does not believe God in this way has made Him out to be and represented Him as a liar, because he has not believed in the evidence, the testimony that God has borne regarding his son. And verse 11, and this is that testimony, that evidence, God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. God bless his word. Now, out of all the things that Jesus did in the Bible, the Holy Spirit took notice and bore witness of two things. As we have read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 to 11. He bore witness of the water and the blood, the water signifies Jesus' baptism, the blood, his death. What is the significance of the water and the blood? Church, this is what God revealed to me. The key is in verse 11. Let me read that to you. And this is that testimony, that evidence. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Eternal life, in other words, is salvation. This is God's testimony. God gave us salvation, and this is in His Son. Church, the witness of the water and blood that the Spirit testified has all to do with salvation in Jesus Christ. Do you see it now? Is it coming out in full color? The Spirit testified about the water and the blood and it relates with salvation in Christ. And I tell you this, most Christians would know the blood. They know that Jesus died for our sins at the cross. But why was the water, the baptism of Jesus, included in salvation found in Christ? We in this church are privileged 
to know this truth. Not everyone. What happened at the baptism of Jesus? Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And Luke takes the time to mention that John is a descendant of Aaron. So what? What does that have to do with salvation in Christ? You see, in the Old Testament, only the descendants of Aaron were given the privilege of administering the sacrificial system. Only they were given the privilege of laying their hands on the unblemished animal. Symbolically transferring the sin of Israel upon the innocent animal. The animal will be slaughtered because the punishment of sin is death. So at the baptism of Jesus, John was the descendant of Aaron. But maybe, maybe you're thinking, well, Aaron had many descendants and they could have lived at that time. Why John the Baptist among all of them? Why John the Baptist? Why was he so special? It's because of this very remark that Jesus says, the law and the prophets prophesied up until John, which means he's the end of the law. He's the end of the prophets. He is the last high priest. And when he baptized Jesus, he transferred all our sin, past, present, and future upon Jesus. Jesus walked for us for three years and ultimately died on the cross because the punishment of our sins, of our iniquities, is death. And once we believe that, our sins are removed. We are forgiven and the Holy Spirit comes into our heart. This is the true gospel. And we present from then on God as the truth. And coming back to our source text in Matthew 7, Jesus said, every good tree will produce good fruit. So the true gospel will also produce good fruit. Or in other words, evidence. The true gospel will show its evidence. So let us see the evidence of the true gospel. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance. I'm going to stop there. That is all we need to know for today's message. So you know my three points already now. <laughs> power, the Holy Spirit, and much assurance. Point number one, church, power. Now the word power in the text, in Greek, is dunamis. And it comes from the root word dynamite. You know dynamite, the explosive power. And it's defined as miraculous power, strength, and might. So what is this power that comes with the gospel? Firstly, the gospel comes with the dunamis power to obliterate sin and to forgive 
sin. There is no other power, authority on the face of this earth that can obliterate sin, but the gospel of God's righteousness, which constitutes Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. When we believe Jesus took all our sin at the baptism, that He died on the cross for our sin, that He rose again and the Spirit is in our heart, sin is obliterated. And we are forgiven. Do I simply say this? Because I felt like it today. No, it's in the Word. Let's look. At Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. For then would he often have had to suffer over and over again since the foundation of the world? But as it now is, he has once for all at the consummation and close of the ages appeared to put away and abolish, obliterate sin by his sacrifice of himself. And if you're wondering who this is, it's none other than Jesus Christ himself. Jesus has obliterated our past, present, and future sin. And that's why we can testify today that we are sinless and righteous. Don't say this for the sake of it. Know why you're saying it. And true enough, the scripture says that He has Put away sin once and for all. And when we testify this to our friends, some may receive, but some may disagree. Some may even argue that what you say or testify is false. And they may even quote you scriptures like 1 John 1 verse 8. Let's take a look at that. It says, if we say we have no sin, refusing to admit that we are sinners, we delude and lead ourselves astray. And the truth which the gospel presents is not in us, does not dwell in our hearts. Is the Bible contradicting itself? You may be asked or posed this question. Doesn't it say in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, that if we say we have no sin, we delude ourselves? Is the Bible contradicting the Bible? Certainly not. Church, the fundamental core truth and principle of the gospel of God's righteousness is the recognition of sin. What do I mean? We were born inherently with sin. We did not sin to become sinners. We were sinners, therefore we sin. And don't get this gospel wrong, even after you are born again, when you walk in the flesh, you will sin. I think all of you know this by now. <laughs> because the sin principle is still active in this flesh. And that's why when we walk in our flesh, we will sin. But here's the good news. Even that sin, Jesus has forgiven. He has obliterated. And that's why today we can testify that we are sinless and righteous. So let's read 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 to 9. Let's read it in its context. Because sometimes it's dangerous when we pluck out a scripture and misinterpret it. Yes, we have to look at the entire 
portion of scripture to understand the context. Let's read 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 to 9. But if we really are living and walking in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have true, unbroken fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us, removes us from all sin and guilt, keeps us cleansed from sin in all its forms and manifestation. And if we say we have no sin, refusing to admit that we are sinners, we delude and lead ourselves astray. And the truth which the gospel presents is not in us, does not dwell in our hearts. And if we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, He is faithful and just, true to His own nature and promises, and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness, and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness, everything not in the conformity to His will in purpose, thought, and action. Church, God is faithful to cleanse us continually from sin because He's faithful to what Jesus had done. Jesus had paid the price in full. That's why if we walk in our flesh and if we sin, the blood of Jesus continuously cleanses us. We are sinless and righteous today, church. Let no one deceive you otherwise. Amen? Hallelujah. When we are truly forgiven, we can forgive others as well. Amen? Praise God. Now the gospel also comes with the power to free us from the bondage of sin. Now, when we were born into this world, we were born as slaves to sin. Things like addiction, habitual sin, are the manifestation of the bondage of sin. And people genuinely know that what they are doing is wrong. And they themselves do not want to get into it, but they keep on falling into the trap of habitual sin. It's become a bondage. But the gospel that we believe in comes with the power to free us from the bondage of sin. Let us read. Romans 6, verse 6 to 7. I'm reading from the Amplified Classic Version. And we know that our old unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with Him in order that our body, which is an instrument of sin, might be made ineffective and inactive for evil, that we might no longer be the slaves of sin. For when a man dies, he is freed, loose, delivered from the power of sin among men. Hallelujah. Say amen if you can. The power of this gospel has freed us from the bondage of sin. What a gospel we believe in, church. Amen. But having said that, if you are an elect today, and if you are born again, and maybe you're still struggling with some habitual sin, you're still struggling with the bondage of sin. I want you to know that your way of escape 
is a spirit. It's walking in the spirit. The word teaches us that what is born of God does not sin. When we walk in the spirit, which is born of God, we are able to escape the bondage of sin. How do we walk in the spirit? A lot of times we say walk in the spirit, walk in the spirit. What, what, what does it mean? It means to set your minds on things above. Reading the word of God, listening to the messages, serving. That's why in this church, pastor gives us ministries to serve in. So we are continually kept in the spirit and can escape from the bondage of sin. If not, we will walk in the flesh and remain in the bondage of sin. Remember, your way of escape is to walk in the Spirit, keeping your mind set on things above. Amen. In this church, you are privileged because you know this truth. A lot of people are trapped in the hold, the stranglehold of sin. They just can't get out. But you have the truth, church. You have the gospel that has the power to free one from the bondage of sin. Amen? Praise the Lord. And church, not only that, the gospel comes with the power to resurrect a dead spirit. Let's read Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you he made alive when you were dead, slain by your trespasses and sins. The reality is before this gospel, we were dead in our sin, we were dead to God, our fellowship with God was non-existent. But when we believed in the gospel of God's righteousness, we were made alive. Our relationship with God was restored. The fellowship is restored. And we can testify today that we are alive. Church, when Jesus rose again, because we were united with him at the baptism, we too rose again into the newness of life. Today, we are alive. Say that wherever you are. Say that in your heart. Say that out loud. Do what you want. But this is your testimony. You are alive. The power of sin is broken. The bondage of sin is broken. You are free from sin and you are. You are alive. It's only found in this gospel. This is the evidence of the true gospel. Amen? Amen. Church, the second evidence that comes with the gospel. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5a. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit. When we believe in the gospel of God's righteousness, when sin is removed, when we are forgiven of our sin, the Holy Spirit comes into our heart as the seal of our redemption to guarantee that we are saved. But that's not the only function and purpose of the Holy Spirit. There are more. Let us take a look at that. John 14 Verse 26, this is Jesus speaking about the Holy Spirit. 
but the comforter counselor helper intercessor advocate strengthener stand by the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name in my place to represent me and act on my behalf he will teach you all things and he will cause you to recall and will remind you of and bring to your remembrance everything that i have told you the holy spirit is not only the seal of your redemption. He is your counselor, your helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby. He's there with you in every moment. And the scripture even goes on to say that He will teach you everything. Even what to say and testify. Maybe you think I'm kidding. Let's take a look at Luke 12, verse 12. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour and moment what you ought to say. He teaches us what to say. And I'm not talking about some Mission Impossible kind of scene where he's in your ear telling you what to say. If he does to you, let me know. I want that as well. He doesn't do that. He teaches us what to say through His Word. Sometimes He teaches us what to say through our experience. Sometimes we're not even conscious of what we're saying. He's just speaking through us. Sometimes when I rewatch some of the sermons that I preached, I forgot that I even prepared that point. I didn't even know. That was not even in my sermon notes. God just flowed. The Spirit will teach you what to say. And while He's teaching you what to say while you testify, He's also convicting the hearts of those who are listening to what you're saying, to those who are listening to your testimony. Let's take a look at John 16 verse 8. And when He comes, He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. He will convict and convince the world and bring demonstration to it about sin, about righteousness, uprightness of heart and right standing with God and about judgment. This is what gave the apostles confidence and boldness to testify about this gospel. Not only was the Holy Spirit empowering them to witness, the Holy Spirit was also working in the hearts of those who were listening. And guess what? This doesn't only apply to the apostles. It applies to us, church. Today, when we testify, he gives us the boldness. He teaches us what to say. At the same time, to those we are testifying to, He will convict their hearts of sin and righteousness and judgment. Amen? This is our testimony, church. This is the evidence of the true gospel. That we have the Holy Spirit. The gospel comes with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's move on to the final evidence of the true gospel. Assurance. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5a. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, confidence, conviction. The gospel that we believe in comes with assurance. You know, everybody likes to be assured. Especially when it comes to big things with big consequences. 
We want to be assured. And I was um, driving to church on a Tuesday morning. I was coming to church to actually record a special presentation with some of them in our church. I won't uh, say any more. Uh, it is for your enjoyment later on during Christmas. So I'm going to keep tight-lipped about it. But anyway, um, I was in my car and I never listened to the radio. I don't know why. But um, while I was driving, the radio was on for some reason and um, this radio station was on and this host was... Um, he was joking about Malaysians and how they, they love the word uh, confirm. <laughs> Double confirm, huh? triple confirm, huh? quadruple confirm. Huh? <laughs> confirm is confirm. Lah. They like assurance. Men likes assurance. They like assurance. Because sometimes they can't afford to make a mistake when it comes to serious things with serious consequences. Church, eternal life and eternal death is serious. And we cannot make a mistake. If we make a mistake on this side of the world, more often than not, we can correct our mistake. Or maybe if we have to suffer throughout our lives, so be it. It's only for a short period of time. 70, 80 years, and we're gone. But what is eternal is life after death. And we can't make a mistake. We can't take it lightly. We can't take it for granted. You need to know the true gospel. The gospel you believe in must come with assurance. And let me tell you this, the gospel of God's righteousness comes with assurance. It comes with confidence. It comes with conviction. When we testify about it. Why? Because the gospel that we believe in is concrete. It is based on the scriptures. When we say John the Baptist laid his hand upon Jesus and transferred all our sin, we did not come up with it. Pastor Paul didn't have a dream and, and, and say it out of the thin air. No, it is based on the Old Testament, the sacrificial system in which the high priest would lay his hand upon the unblemished lamb and transfer symbolically the sins of Israel. That's where it came from. In Hebrews 10 verse 1, it says that the old foreshadows what is to come. It's not the reality, but it's foreshadowing the reality to come. The baptism of Jesus by John was what the old foreshadowed. The death of Jesus on the cross was what the Old Testament, what the scriptures were telling us through the symbols and sacrifice, the sacrificial system. It was all foreshadowing what was to come. The gospel that you believe in, church, is concrete. And that's why we can testify about it with conviction in our hearts. Because we know that it is based on the Word of God. When I testified about this gospel to my friend David, who I'm delighted is part of our family now, He's eagerly waiting to meet all of you physically. But I'm um, coming back to what I was saying. When I testified to him about the gospel, I told him this, and he can testify whether I lied or not. I told him, brother, I don't want to tell you what I think, what I feel, what I perceive, what I dreamt about. I want to tell you what the Word of God says. 
The gospel according to the scriptures. Jesus died according to the scriptures. And today, by the grace of God, he has believed in that gospel. Because it's concrete church. There's nothing that we should be afraid about when testifying because it is based on the word of God. If our gospel was based on assumptions, we have so much to worry about. But it is not. It is from the word of God. And that's why when I shared with him, he immediately received the gospel because it came with much assurance, with much conviction and confidence. And here's another assurance that this gospel gives you. God hears and will answer your prayer according to His will. Let's take a look at 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15. And this is the confidence, the assurance, and the privilege of boldness which we have in Him. We are sure that if we ask anything, Make any request according to His will in agreement with His own plan. He listens to and hears us. Praise God. And if, since we positively know that He listens to us in whatever we ask, we also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted us as present possessions the requests made of Him. What a gospel we believe in. God hears our prayers and He answers them according to His will and purpose. Before this gospel church, no matter how we prayed, no matter how many tears came out, God couldn't hear us. God couldn't help us. It's not that he was deaf or his hand was short. Sin was a barrier. And let's read Isaiah 59 verse 1 to 2. It tells you exactly what I said. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. But what a privilege it is that today this gospel that we believe in comes with the power to obliterate sin. He has forgiven us. The barrier has been removed. Today when we pray, He hears us. And He will answer us. And we can be confident of that. Amen. The gospel we believe in church comes with much assurance. What a gospel we believe in. What a gospel that we testify to the world. Church, I've come to the end of my message today. Three evidence that comes with the gospel. Can we head back to 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5a? We learn today, for our gospel did not only come in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance. Do you see that evidence in your life? Has your sin been obliterated? Are you free from the bondage of sin? Is your spirit made alive? Do you have the Holy Spirit in your heart? And are you assured 
even in the storms of life that the gospel that you believe in is true even if you die you will go to heaven if you do you believe in the true gospel that is the evidence amen maybe you tuned in today and you thought you would leave halfway but god has kept you until this moment right now and you want this in your life you want this gospel in your life you want that power you want the holy spirit and you want that assurance in your life you are that person all that you need to do is believe believe in what believe that when jesus was baptized by john the baptist john the baptist who was your representative passed all your sin upon jesus the unblemished lamb of god and that jesus walked for you 3 years and died on the cross to pay for the wages of your sin the punishment of your sin and that he rose again on the third day when you believe that god deposits his spirit the holy spirit into your hearts and we believe that you are born again from then on all it takes is faith church All it takes is faith. This gospel comes to us by grace, through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. Amen. Let's pray right now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful gospel of God's righteousness. which constitutes Jesus's baptism, death and resurrection. We thank you Father that out of the billions of people in this world that you have chosen us and you have called us into light. And I pray Father that we will be bold to share and testify of this gospel to the world and we'll start with our friends with our family father give us the boldness through your spirit we've seen the evidence in our life father and we want others to also experience the same we surrender our whole lives to your will and your purpose In Jesus name we pray amen amen amen